him. I was just singing a song that said, I sought the Lord and he <clears throat> answered. <laughs> I didn't give the, uh, I, didn't, I didn't take the opportunity. I was given it by Caroline, but I didn't take the opportunity of introducing that lovely young lady that I came with. Um, mm, caught my eye this morning. I thought I'd travel with her to church, sat down next to her. And uh, that is Aroha. She's my wife, and happy Mother's Day to you, mother of two girls, one of whom has made us grandparents, as I said earlier. And we'll just see what the day unfolds for the extension of family. And my connection with uh, Michael goes back to our journeys. I explained that I've been in ministry. Uh, my first church I received as associate pastor at age 23. You don't know what you're doing at that age, really. Um, took my first church at 28 uh, down in South Australia, then over to Perth 10 years later. And that's where Michael and I crossed paths. We have two daughters who became friends at school. And so as dads um, sort of turning up for school pickups and deliveries at the same time, we shared a common heart for our children, for life for the Lord. And as Michael departed for his journeys, and then a few years later, we departed to continue our journeys. It's been a real blessing to, to reconnect. And as uh, Michael alluded, when you're having that garage sale on the 1st of June, we've uh, enlisted Michael's help for our daughter's wedding on that day up at Noosa. And uh, I don't, my qualifications to, to marry um, have slipped by because I left the country. I lost those. So we were hunting around for someone who could sign the bits of paper and Michael very generously said, I'll offer you that service. He's, yeah. he's, 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 he's expensive. He's expensive. Was he, did he charge it? Because he, no. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's $2,000 here. Before I get into the word, I just have such a, a bursting heart that wants to honor each and every one of you. We walked in this morning a little bit later than I wanted to, but there we are. We made it here. And to the sound of life, people chatting with one another, enjoying each other. And this is our third visit with you over the last uh, couple of years since we've been living in these northern suburbs. And every time, there's just a sense of life about this place. And then when you gather, there's a sense of always promoting mission. This is a life that you've experienced, you know, but you want others to desperately know as well. There's always been that stop to say, What's happening other places around the world that God's connect, connected us to? In Zambia, what a rich connection to be somewhere around the world, but for Jesus' sake, to take the love and what we know of him here into that place practically. But it's not just halfway around the world. Through community matters, you're ministering to people in your community here in Australia desperately in need, and that's such a vital aspect of who you are in Christ and in, in your worship today. It's all been about him. I was, my bedtime reading last night took me to a, a book I've just finished off last night. In the last chapter, the writer, it's a spiritual biography of a man uh, who was um, C.M. Blakelock. He was a Bible uh, expert of ancient languages, uh, a New Zealander. So I was reading his, his book. And at the end, he says, I paraphrase, something like, I can't understand people who get into the pulpit and that's so much about them when the Christ that we know is so rich and large, the half could ne'er be told, the song tells us. I want to be speaking of him and his love, which we've already been introduced to this morning in the worship that's been provided. Be a Christ-centered people. Uh, you are. That identifies you. May the community around you know that, and may that touch continue into places around the world where God gives you that opportunity. It's been a rich experience just to sit with you. I pray the opening of God's word uh, enriches it just a little bit more. Could we turn to the book of Nehemiah, please? I'm not sure how many Mother's Day services around Australia. Are indeed, well, yeah, it's Australia and New Zealand celebrate it today. I'm not sure about the rest of the world, but how many today are going to be in the book of Nehemiah for a little bit of reference for a theme for Mother's Day? And this is where we are, and we are uh, introduced to this man, Nehemiah, who served in, um, who was serving in Persia, uh, the, new, the new controlling empire of that part of the world, serves as a wine taster to the king, 
uh, a significant role, an important role, a responsible role. He builds an intimate relationship with the king so that one day in chapter one, when he is downcast because he's heard news of his homeland back in what we now know as modern Israel, uh, as a Jew, he's concerned about what's happening there. Many would be concerned in this day also. He's downcast. The king says, what's the problem? Here's a king who cares about what's happening in his wine taster's life, the cupbearer to the king. And he tells him, I've heard news of my homeland. It's in a terrible state. What would you like to do about it? I'd like to go back and see if we could fix it. Sure, you can go back, and I'll give you some resources to go with you. What a blessing of God. But it starts in the place of prayer. And I neglected to mention that first thing we were whisked off to as we arrived this morning was a little prayer place in the back. You were praying people. Your pastor cares about prayer shaping all that we do and all that we are and our connection with God is so vital. Nehemiah had learned that. And it's a beautiful prayer that he prays in chapter 1. So he gets sent to this place that's in ruins. A temple has already been built, but the city itself, it's in disrepair. So I went to Jerusalem. This is Nehemiah chapter 2 from verse 11. Nehemiah speaking. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I'd not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went out through the valley gate towards the jack jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved towards the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because I has, I, as yet I had not said anything to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or the officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. Lord, I pray this is a good word, not because I've fashioned anything, but because you have. You've offered this to us already out of your word, and the thoughts that we receive from this wider narrative that Nehemiah tells, would it stir us today? Would it be right for Mother's Day, right for any day, that we reflect on your word and allow you to pierce our hearts with what we need to hear this day? Open our hearts, our minds, that we receive and indeed, this God who is speaking that we've been singing about, this God who speaks, we don't miss what you say to us today. I pray this in your name. Amen. All right, Mother's Day Association, if I say the word mother, you say what comes into your head. What sort of characteristic, what sort of adjective would you give to the word mother? Selfless, I like it. Patient. No sleep. <laughs> Exhausted. Yeah. Anyone going to say exhausting? Mothers are exhausting. Yeah. And I hear the word love down the back. Bingo, you get the prize. If I had a jelly snake right now, I'd be throwing it in your direction. Oh, I love a good jelly. I like the, anyway, anyway. The, the, I was going to say the different colored ones, you get all the mix of flavor, but that's all right. Uh, there are so many words, caring, compassionate, that we tend to give with this idea of mothers and, and a mother's love. We would use that word to describe some of the purest ideas of love, that a mother's love. Scripture talks about that in one part. Could a mother stop loving? <clears throat> we live in a world where, unfortunately, some of us would say, well, yeah. The brokenness of humanity means that we've maybe experienced or ob observed mothers who lost the capacity to love, maybe never knew how to love. But when God replicates the very best of love, then we see that he is saying, I'll never stop loving. Even if she could, I'll never stop loving you. 
Well, the idea of loving and loving well is not just something that we would say to mothers, hey, well done, on ya, good job, thanks for loving us, off you go, we celebrate you today. But the idea of a love that encapsulates the very best of us, that selflessness, that patience, all of that, what Scripture talked about, what we heard today from 1 Corinthians 13, that small passage, that is, thank you, that is for all of us. To live in that quality of love. And it's the quality of love we've already reflected on this morning that comes to us from God. He is that quality of love. So here's our challenge. If we can sit here and go, yeah, we see it. We can think about it. We, we can process that. We've sung about it, that God has that quality of love. And we've looked around and maybe thought of our mums or being a mum and go, I've offered that quality of love to my children and grandchildren. Well done, us. That that's the secret is that it's not just that we're thinking about it, but it is love that is put into action, that we see it. In Nehemiah, already this quick overview of these first two chapters is God had a love for his people and stirred Nehemiah to say, you're my servant for this time, this place, to do something about it, to refix the city, to give my people hope again. Hope, that word that marks you as a community. Kabulcha, new hope church. And how many churches as I've traveled around the northern suburbs are living with this idea of hope, the hope center down on Anzac Ave, down on, uh, towards the peninsula, the hope church down in Burpengary that I've got family attending today. Hope is the message of the gospel, of the God who loves us, and it's a hope that we can receive as love and be participants in that love, every one of us, mums, absolutely for you, but for all of us to put that love into action, that we receive it, we do something about it because love has transformed our lives, the divine love that sits in our hearts. Somebody coined the phrase some years ago, I've seen it on um, plaques and billboards, love unexpressed is love unknown. For God has expressed his love to us. This table before us has reminded us again, as it does for you weekly, God so loved the world, he sent his son into the world to die for us, that we may live with hope. We may live with life. We may live with joy. And we could again start calling out the characteristics of this new life in Christ and to spend our afternoon delighting in that. But we're a people. You are a people. We're called to be a people who share that with others. God bless you and continue to do that with all that is within you. Israel need to be reminded of that at this time in their history. This is post-exile. They had nationhood. They had been promised one in the line of David would come, and it seems like all of that had been lost and forgotten. Because the nation had been destroyed, the temple had been destroyed, 70 years in exile, and they've already returned. The, the grace of God has spoken, and world leaders like Osiris of Persia have said, you can start to go back to your country. And the first thing was, we've got to rebuild the temple, but the city is still in disrepair. We don't have any more resources. We've got, we can't do anything about it. We're going back to the UK where they say the word knelt. Certainly up in the north where we were living once before, can't do knelt about it. But God can, and God has a way. And so the, the servant Nehemiah shares the vision, and the people get excited about it. If I'm a servant of God today that simply is sharing again a vision of a God who loves, and it's not just a mother's love, but for all of us, our love as his children, receiving love from him, letting it flow through our lives to others, then if we leave this place motivated again, redirected again, reminded again as this table does, as the word does when it's open for us, then job done. That we seek that love poured into our hearts that it would pour out from us into Zambia, into anywhere, into the neighbors and indeed into our own family. So Nehemiah shares the vision and then in chapter three, the people go to work 
because love unexpressed is love unknown and they start to express this love. And in your own time this afternoon, I'd encourage you to open up the word and just read through chapter three. I love this, this chapter. And all it does is it recites a whole lot of names and the work that they did in building the, the wall together. It's the sort of scripture that you could easily just read through and go, oh, that was interesting. What else have you got for me, God, out of the text? But I'm going to highlight just a few verses in answer to the questions about how is love being expressed here? The first question is, well, um, in chapter three, as it's described how they go to work, does everyone go to work? Does everyone catch a sense of the vision? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. Verse five of chapter three, we read that the next section was being repaired by the men of Tekoa. So it's going through all the list of the sections of the wall and the, who is repairing it. Really fascinating stuff. But in chapter 5, the next section was being repaired by the men of Tekoa. But their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. Can you just picture the picture? All the people, the, Israel, the people who have returned have gathered around Nehemiah and he shared the vision. We've got the resources. We can do this. God has given me favor. I've left the, the, the king's table to come and work with you. He becomes the governor of this area. So we have got the resources, but it's going to need us working together. Are we all together? Yes, we're all together. Can you picture it? Some people with their like this. But like the Pharisees that Jesus faced, but like people in our own day and age when we get excited about something and they sit back. Mm, yeah. I can remember my first foray into youth ministry, um, walked with in a Christian home all my life, attended youth, and about 17, 18, start to assume a place of leadership. And I was the games guy after the service. All right, we're going to play some games now. And I can, I can remember when I was 12, 13, 14, game time. Yeah, I'm in. What are we playing? What are we playing? Okay, let's, let's go for it. 17, 18, the 12 and 13-year-olds, just a few years younger than me, but a change in society to the entertained. Rather than I've learned how to entertain myself, they were sitting back like this going, well, what's the game? Oh, well, we're going to do this and this. Yeah, no. Nah. You entertain me. You offer me something. What, what are you offering? These people here have heard Nehemiah's offer and thought, yeah, nah. The nobles of Tekoa, not everyone, not everyone is going to get on the bus, the caravan of love. Some people are just going to get it. They don't want to be there. They don't want the world to be loving. I don't, we can't read all their motivations, but the depravity and the brokenness of this world has impacted some people to a point where right now they're saying, I don't want what you're selling, what you're offering. Because we're not selling it, are we? We just don't give it away. Yeah, no thanks. Maybe they didn't trust Nehemiah's motivation. People don't trust the church today in general terms. Prove it to me before you expect me to get excited about this. So the men of the nobles of Tekoa, while well, the men were putting their backs into it, the nobles are saying, yeah, I'm, I'm not buying it just yet. I'm not in. And so they don't get involved. Is it everyone that gets on board? No, it's not, unfortunately. Secondly, well, well, then who does do the work? Let's have a look, verse, look at verse 8. There was Uziel, the son of Hahaiah, he was one of the goldsmiths. He repaired the next section, and Hananiah was a perfume maker who made repairs next to him. Hard labor, building a wall, picking up rocks, placing them into each other, hands getting grazed. Not sure what sort of gloves they would have worn in those days, but picking up the rocks, sweat of the brow, back-breaking work. We've got to build this wall. And we're looking at a goldsmith and a perfume maker. I can imagine the perfume maker walking up to the job with his hands like this. It's very delicate work. But love motivates these two individuals to say, I'm in. 
This is what I do for a living, for a crutch. But right now, this is the job that needs doing, and I'm in. The New Testament develops this idea that it's just bringing what we can bring, isn't it? Lord, you see me, you know me, you made me, you fashioned me. I don't need to, have, I don't need to be an expert in this field, but if there's a job that you fit me to fill, I'll do my best to fill it. Who worked? Those who had the right heart for it. Later on in verse 12, there's a little interesting uh, note here that Shalom, the son of Halohesh, see, half the fun of this chapter is just reading the names. Shalom, the son of Halohesh, was a ruler of the half district of Jerusalem. He repaired the next section with the help of his daughters. Fancy women getting involved. Bit dated standing up in front of you now, isn't it? When we just to say, come on, we're all in. We can all women today. And for these recent generations saying, we're perfectly capable of helping out. And absolutely you are. But here they, in this day and age, it's something special, something different. Daughters get involved. Looking at their dad going, can we help as well? Of course you can. Come on, come on. Don't know how old they were. But willing workers able to do what they could. Now, unfortunately, for Mother's Day, and the, the special theme of Mother's Day, there's no mention of mums helping out. I'm building the wall, but I'm just imagining someone's looking after the kiddies while the others are working. Somebody's over in the kitchen making all the meals for the workers, yeah? We've just had a team, friends of ours, come back from a mission trip to Vanuatu, and I was sitting down last Sunday with an 18-year-old, and I said, how did you enjoy the trip? Did you get involved in the work? They were there to build like a, 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 a domestic house that could be double as like an office center and um, for the church's development there in Vanuatu. And she said, look, I tried to help on the first day, but I, I just wasn't getting anything right. You know, I, I don't hammer nails particularly well. Boom, you know, I've watched people, boom, boom, boom. You have three hits and it's in. And for me, it's about 17 and I've gone a bit that way and a bit that way. So I could totally get this young lady saying, my hands just weren't working well. But what I realized I could do was I could go and prepare the morning tea and the afternoon tea and bring it round to everybody and then work on the lunch. They didn't stop for morning tea and afternoon tea. It was eat on the go while they were working. Uh, she found her place to serve. So even women got involved. Even women. Ooh. Who worked? Those that were willing. How did they work? Well, in verses 10 and 11, we read about one guy that works on his own place. He's worked on his own house. So he's, he's come back, the descendant of someone who, that used to be my grandfather's home 70-odd years ago. It's in disrepair now. So I'll start building that up together. But someone working with him who's not working on his own place, but a, a, gra a grander scheme of section of wall. This has nothing to do with me. This is not mine, but... This is ours, and both of them are okay. We tend to our own, and we help others as well. Paul teaches that in Galatians. Carry your own burdens, but bear the burdens of other people as well. And so people are involved just doing whatever they could to do. 1 Corinthians 12, just before that love chapter, the highlight of love that we heard a portion of that this morning, that it's the greatest of gifts from God, the capacity to love. And it has to come from God. If it's just in us, it runs out. But when he talks about gifts, Paul says, to each one a gift has been given, 1 Corinthians 12, 7. So we work according to the gifting we have, to the vision we have, to the energy we have. And I could be guilty, many of you, thinking, well, I'll do it all in the local church. And I go beyond my capacity and burn out and get tired or get grumpy, get bitter. Those things have happened in my past where I've just thought, oh, I don't want to be at church anymore because I'm doing everything. And the beautiful picture alternative to that, that God wants to build for his church, is turning up one day as a pastor and after the service realizing there was nothing for me to do because the people were ministering to each other. And a couple of weeks later, I get a phone call. Are you open to a call to another place? And I said, I think I am because we've moved from being me-centered to people now ministering their gifts and abilities. For the years before that, this was a church in South Australia. 
Before that, it was, Pastor, we need, you need, this needs to be done. And I'm spinning, doing everything. But as people were stirred, recognizing God had loved them, God, God had gifted them, they were now able to minister according to what God had done in their hearts and lives. They worked with all their might, and the church started to operate and function well. I'm not needed here anymore. I'll go and apply. See if there's another church that needs to learn this lesson. And we're praying through at the moment, a church in the UK, that may need to learn some of these things as well. So we see how they worked. We're seeing who worked. But finally, why did they work? We go back to that text that we read earlier. I told them, Nehemiah says, about the gracious hand of my God that was on me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, well, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. The motivation is a vision had been set before them by Nehemiah, God's man at God's time, speaking God's word, and they got excited by that. Well, the theme for today is love. Mothers who have loved us, perfectly, imperfectly. Love that we have had for our mothers that gets expressed today. Hey, mum, love you. But greater than a mother's love is the love of a heavenly father who has maternal qualities as well, like that nurture, the wings under the, for the chooks, for the, for the babies. And to realize that that's the purity of love that we need and that is offered to us. Love motivated these people. A love for their city, a love for one another. Hey, you need some work on your house. I'll help you out. Let's let this place be all that it wants to be. Motivated by love. I hope they were learning and we see through the remainder of the book of Nehemiah a love for God and his word and his promises for Israel to be reestablished in their day. And they are a broken people a few chapters later when they realize as they hear the word of the Lord, the law is read out to them and they realize we haven't been keeping this. We've been living wrong. There are broken people in repentance. That's what the word of God can do to our hearts. If, if we understand that God has loved us with an everlasting love and it's revealed and the sacrifice of his son, Jesus. There's our motivation to say, I, I need to love you back in return. Give me all the qualities of love that will help me love you well and have that love revealed to a world around us as well. In Caboolture, New Hope Church of Christ, you're doing that so well. The better days ahead. Amen? Live in love. God bless you.